The Infanterie Cannon Y91, or IKV-91 for short, is remembered as one of the best in its class despite not achieving any combat success, a perception shared by many regarding Swedish military systems. Its brilliant design makes this vehicle special but also somewhat strange. Today we're investigating the IKV-91. Is it a light tank or assault gun? The IKV-91 is generally classified as a light tank by the international community. However, the Swedes, its creators, typically prefer a definition based on how a vehicle is used rather than how it is built. Since they designed the IKV-91 to provide fire support to infantry units, they called it Infantry Cannon Wine, meaning Infantry Cannon Car or Motor Carrier. Therefore, we can initially answer the question that it was an assault gun. To better understand this distinction, let's go step by step. The IKV-91 was developed in response to the Soviet threat in the 1960s. During the First Cold War, Sweden held significant importance as a large country with a small population, but a vital strategic location and plentiful natural resources. Consequently, in the event of a Third World War, it would likely be one of the primary targets of the massive armies of the USSR. Nevertheless, this nation also possessed its own distinct advantages. Soviet ground forces would need to pass through Finland and or the Baltic Sea before reaching Sweden. These forces were not as well equipped and large as those deployed in Central Europe due to the NATO threat. Additionally, the harsh weather and rugged terrain in northern Sweden would bolster defensive efforts. By the time Soviet divisions reached the border, the Finns would significantly wear them down. The Soviet naval infantry could land a relatively small and lightly armed unit in Sweden. However, despite the country's small population, the Swedish armed forces consisted of well-trained personnel. Additionally, soldiers utilized high-quality innovative weapon systems domestically developed to meet unique local needs. Nevertheless, by the early 1960s, most of the army's inventory was now outdated. Therefore, Sweden first acquired Centurion Mark 10s armed with a 105mm gun, then modernized former Centurion Mark 5s with the same armament. The indigenous tank program also reached a certain level. To reduce the silhouette of the tanks, engineers opted for the turretless design, which was a bold choice. By the end of the decade, the Swedish Army's tank units would possess sufficient capability to counter Soviet heavy armor. In the mid-1960s, it was time to develop a new assault gun to replace the outdated IKV-73, IKV-102 and IKV-103s of the mechanized infantry units. This new gun would also succeed the PVKV M43 tank destroyer and the STRV-74 light tank, establishing standardization within the inventory. The USSR deployed its latest armor in Central Europe while the T-55s and BTR-60s continued to form the backbone of the force in the north. Additionally, the naval infantry also operated the T-55 and BTR-60s as well as PT-76 light tank. Therefore, a relatively lightly armored assault gun with a 90mm cannon would be both lightweight and affordable while still meeting Sweden's requirements. After the studies, three different companies submitted 14 various designs. The Swedish army selected Hegland's proposal because it shared some components with the previously acquired PBV-302 armored vehicles. However, it resembled more of a fire support vehicle or light tank than a conventional turretless assault gun. It was odd because at this time Sweden was preparing to introduce the turretless main battle tank into its inventory but had opted for an assault gun with a turret. The first of the three prototypes of the IKV-91 was completed in 1969, with the remaining two following in 1970. After extensive trials, Stockholm awarded Heglunds, now known as BAE Systems Heglunds, a contract for 200 vehicles in 1972. Since it was the first infantry cannon carrier with a 90mm gun, the army designated it as Infantry Cannon Y-90-1. Sweden later ordered 12 additional assault guns. Hegland completed production in 1975, delivering a total of 212 units. 
The driver sat inside the hull while the other three crew members were positioned in the turret with the commander and gunner on the right and the loader on the left. Since it was designed for fire support for infantry units, the IKV-91 featured light armor protection. The all-welded steel hull and turret had a thickness of between 4 and 8 mm. The frontal arc was resistant to 20 mm armor-piercing rounds, which was adequate since the Soviet motorized rifle regiments were equipped with the BTR-60 armed with a 14.5 mm KPVT machine gun. The sides of the hull above the tracks were double-skinned with the main armor inside the tracks. The space used for storing accessories and diesel fuel provided increased protection against high-explosive and high-explosive anti-tank rounds. The engine compartment at the rear was separated from the fighting compartment by a bulkhead. In the 1950s, the Swedish military and engineers had carefully studied combat reports from the Second World War and the Korean War, which had indicated that increasing height also increased the risk of being hit. More than half of the tanks had been knocked out because their turrets had been penetrated. As a result, they decided that the silhouette must be kept as low as possible. Like the STRV-103, the IKV-91 was designed based on this principle, improving its survivability whilst making it a superb hunter in the hull-down position. The assault gun featured six smoke grenade dischargers mounted on either side of the turret and was capable of operation in a CBRN environment. Interestingly, the STRV-103 lacked any fighting ability in such conditions. The IKV-91's power pack was installed diagonally in the engine compartment to minimize the overall hull length. The assault gun employed the same clutch and brake steering system as the PBV-302 and permitted continuous slip steering. The steering brakes at the each end of the drive shaft were also utilized as the main brakes. Thanks to its high power to weight ratio of 22.2 horsepower per ton and its low ground pressure of 0.49 kg per square centimeter, the vehicle had excellent cross country mobility, particularly on muddy and snowy terrain. For further increased traction in deep snow, the track shoes could be removed and conical spikes extending 50 mm below the surface of the track links could be fitted. The built-in blowtorch and electric preheater allowed engine starts from minus 35 degrees Celsius. The vehicle was fully amphibious, moving in the water with its tracks at a speed of 6.5 km per hour. The commander's cupola could be traversed through 240 degrees and operated either locked to the turret or counter-rotating. This design provided the commander with a good battlefield view under armor protection for target detection and identification. An electric service system supplied precise power to its traverse in either mode. The gunner's TP-1050L sight had a 7x magnification with a 9 degree field of view in the day channel. Its passive night vision subunit used a microchannel image intensifier tube with an 8.5x magnification and a 53 degree field of view. Additionally, the assault gun was equipped with the Liron mortars on the turret roof at the rear for deploying illumination rounds. The IKV-91's ballistic computer calculated the correct gun laying angles. The commander had no direct access to this computer. However, a mechanical connection from one of the Terranians transmitted gun elevation to a collimator, which was positioned in front of its sight when the cupola was aligned with the turret. Subsequently, an image of a ballistic graticule was projected into the commander's field of view. The power control of the non-stabilized turret was electrohydraulic with a manual backup available. The manually loaded 90mm L54 Bufosh KV9873 rifle low-pressure gun had an elevation and depression angles ranging from plus 15 to minus 10 degrees. It featured a lower recoil force and reduced muzzle effects, including flame, smoke and dust ejection. However, it could not fire sub-caliber ammunition. The barrel was equipped with a fume extractor and a thermal sleeve. The rate of fire was 8 rounds per minute. The KV-9873 had a maximum range of 2500 meters. A 90mm high-explosive anti-tank shell could penetrate up to 600mm of armor. The IKV-91 carried 59 rounds of 90mm ammunition, with 16 stowed in red racks at the loader station, 18 to the right of the driver, 
and the remaining 25 in the chassis on the left side behind the turret. The 7.62mm KSPM-39 machine guns were a Swedish development of the Browning M1917 machine guns. The crew of the IKV-91 consists of four people, a commander, a gunner, a loader and a driver. The vehicle is 8.84 meters long, 3 meters wide and 2.32 meters high. Its combat weight is 16.3 tons. The 330 horsepower Volvo Penta TD120 A turbocharged diesel engine provides a top speed of 65 km per hour. The range of the IKV-91 is 500 km. The amphibious vehicle can negotiate 0.8 meter vertical steps and 2.8 meter trenches. It has one 90mm KV-90S73 main gun and two 7.62mm KSPM-39 machine guns. None of the IKV-91 variants went into serial production. The version armed with a 105mm Rheinmetall RH-105-11 low recoil gun was the IKV-91-105, although its proper designation should have been the IKV-104. It was developed as an upgrade package for the IKV-91. India evaluated it alongside the French AMX-10 PAC-90 but ultimately did not choose either one of the options. In the early 1980s, Sweden considered replacing the gun turret with launchers for RB-55 anti-tank missiles, the Swedish designation for the BGM-71 tow. However, it decided not to proceed with the plan and instead converted former IKV-102-103s into the PVR-BV-551. For trial purposes, an IKV-91 hull was fitted with the AMOS turret. Additionally, another assault gun was converted into a road mine clearing vehicle. The Swedish army assigned the IKV-91 to its infantry brigades, each usually consisting of one company of 12 vehicles. Only the 10th mechanized brigade had two companies in the 1980s. Although early assault guns faced hydraulic problems, these issues were quickly resolved and the IKV-91 enjoyed a smooth and well-loved career. In the early years of its service, the Swedish army nicknamed it as Jarvan, meaning Wolverine. However, this nickname did not become popular among users, possibly because they had not yet witnessed Hugh Jackman's memorable performance. A rifle section could be mounted on the rear hull, enabling a vehicle-carrying infantry to conduct autonomous operational maneuvers throughout the brigade area for surprise attacks. The IKV-91 was not a tank destroyer. It was not designed to engage heavy main battle tanks. Its 90mm gun had sufficient penetration capability against T-54 and T-55 tanks or even the T-62 if the lock was on its side. Even the Swedes later started to use these assault guns in reorganized independent mechanized battalions alongside the SCRV-101 and 102 tanks. Following the end of the First Cold War, Sweden cut its defense budget and has shown no interest in the offer to replace the IKV-91s with CV-90 variants equipped with a 105 or 120mm guns. The IKV-91 was not a light tank. It was neither an organic component of armored units nor intended for reconnaissance or flank actions. In fact, the IKV-91's design with its turret differed from conventional assault guns. Since it was based on the PBV-302, we might state that the best definition should have been a fire support version of this armored personnel carrier. However, we humbly accept that it's not really our place to tell the Swedes what their vehicle was. Following the end of the First Cold War, Sweden retired the IKV-91 in 2002 due to budget cuts. Moreover, the 90mm gun was no longer suitable for modern warfare and the assault gun fleet needed a comprehensive modernization. Although the IKV-91 was never involved in combat or exported, it was regarded as one of the best in its class at the time, showcasing Swedish engineering ingenuity. Thanks for watching our video and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell button to be notified of our new videos. Also, you can now click the join button to support our channel. And as always, we would greatly appreciate all of your likes, comments and shares.